Hello everyone, welcome to Ideas and Insights. I am Badri Nath Rao, your host for this program. If there is one topic on which we all have relatively crystallized opinions, it is religion. Love or loathe it, religion engages our minds and emotions in ways that nothing else can. It can be as edifying as it can be egregious. Religion ennobles us just as quickly as it can incite our basest instincts. Many claim to have renounced their faith, yet religion does not abandon them. In more ways than we care to acknowledge, belief in a transcendental reality as affirmation, negation, or indifference remains a part of our psyche. A polymorphous phenomenon, religion has the magical ability to unite rank strangers. It can also divide people across generations and trigger gory conflicts. In a world where most people have in the memorable words of the Communist Manifesto, drowned their conscience in the icy waters of egoistical calculations, religion is a soothing balm. It comforts the afflicted and offers hope when there is unrelieved darkness. Religion is a bulwark against the relentless onslaught of impermanence, contingency and scarcity. As many will attest, God is the last refuge for an alienated soul. Sublime though it is, religion also has an unprepossessing underbelly. It manifests as zealotry, fundamentalism, violence, hatred and parochialism. Goaded by religious fervor, we have fought wars, killed with abandon, inflicted mayhem, and discriminated against fellow human beings. Unelected religious identity is routinely invoked to inferiorize whole communities. These contradictory dimensions of religion and its enduring longevity raise several foundational questions. Why is belief central to our lives? What explains our human impulse to repose faith in a supernatural reality? How did religion evolve and why does it continue to animate our imagination? What is the evolutionary purpose of religion and what social functions does it perform? What are the neurological underpinnings of religion and how does it affect our brain and body? Above all, if religion is here to stay, how can we engage with it in life enhancing ways? These questions constitute the kernel of a new prodigious work of scholarship titled How Religion Evolved and Why It Endures, published by Oxford University Press in 2022. Its author, Dr. Robin Dunbar, is an emeritus professor of evolutionary psychology at the University of Oxford in the United Kingdom. An anthropologist and evolutionary psychologist by training, he is a redoubtable scholar who believes in taking all knowledge into his province, blending insights from disciplines as disparate as evolutionary biology, anthropology, psychology, the history, philosophy, and sociology of religion, neuroscience, and religious studies, Professor Dunbar offers a seminal account of the vicissitudes of religion from the earliest times to the present. Ten singular themes stand out in his book, replete with references to various religions, 
scientific studies, and social science scholarship. First, Professor Dunbar points out that religion is not a modern phenomenon. From its earliest incarnation as an immersive experience, religion has remained a part of our lives. It is universal, and over time, it tends to fragment. Second, religion is a function of what Professor Dunbar calls the mystical stance, the aspect of human psychology that predisposes us to believe in a transcendent world. The mystical stance emerges from two psychological sources, belief in the spiritual dimension of human life and altered states of consciousness induced by trance. The endorphin system produces trance states in which we experience intense immersion in consciousness beyond our own. According to Professor Dunbar, this capacity to engage with the metaphysical world is vital for two reasons. First, it sparks the neurobiological basis of social bonding, creating a sense of commitment. Second, the religious dimension effectively advances social cohesion more than other bonding behaviors. Third, new and contemporary forms of religions with elaborate theologies, rituals, and beliefs, etc., often referred to as doctrinal religions, build on older pagan mystical faiths, popularly known as shamanic religions. The elements of immersive forms of religion used to bond small-scale communities, singing, dancing, synchronized behavior, rituals, fasting, feasting, etc., are still present in all doctrinal religions. They provide the emotional basis for personal belief and commitment and this psychological foundation for a sense of commitment in modern religions. Fourth, religion is good for us at both the individual and societal levels. It provides a framework for making sense of our world, binds communities, fosters pro-social dispositions, has a salutary effect on our mental and physical well-being, and provides cures for certain ailments through the placebo effect or through medicinal herbs and plants. Fifth, referring to community size and the social brain hypothesis, the simple linear relationship between the typical social group of a species and the size of its brain, Professor Dunbar maintains that natural human social groups and personal social networks fit this hypothesis. He avers that an optimal size for congregations is a trade-off between two conflicting demands, creating a sense of belonging and being large enough to tolerate turnover in membership without putting the group's viability at risk. This optimal size, according to Professor Dunbar, is around 150 members. Even a slight increase in the size of the congregation leads to instability. Sixth, Professor Dunbar shines a light on the psychological underpinnings of social relationships and the neurobiological mechanisms involved in social bonding. Religion cements these bonds and fortifies communal relationships through strategies such as activating the endorphin system, mentalizing, the ability to understand someone else's intentions, rituals, and synchronous behaviors like dancing, emotional storytelling, etc. Seventh, religion evolved 200,000 years ago 
coinciding with the appearance of modern humans and doctrinal religions with their high moralizing God emerged during the Neolithic age. They enabled us to move beyond small face-to-face -face societies to the vast cities we live in today. Eighth, Professor Dunbar points out that doctrinal religions seek to forge large communal bonds but are not always successful. As communities exceed the optimal size of 100 to 200 people, they splinter into sects and cults led by charismatic leaders. Ninth, though largely beneficial, religion also has a baneful influence on society. Its power to provoke primordial passions far exceeds that of any secular ideology. Lastly, transcendent religion has no secular humanistic substitute regardless of its lacunae. Professor Dunbar posits that religion is a profoundly human trait and will be part of our lives for the foreseeable future. He joins me now to discuss the main themes of his book. After such a uh, incisive summary of my book. I, I can't believe you didn't write it yourself. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. I appreciate it. It was very, very enlightening for, for me to, to uh, hear such a clear um, exposition of what the book's about. <laughs> Thank you, Professor Dunbar. I appreciate that. Let's begin with uh, uh, some definitional issues for the sake mm. of clarity and for the benefit of our viewers. You talk about two religions in your book, doctrinal religions and shamanic religions. So let's begin with your definition of religion and what you mean by shamanic religions and doctrinal religions. So I guess the key um, to understanding what religion is about. And, and there are probably more definitions and arguments about the definitions of religion Correct. than almost anything else. So, uh, and those kind of disputes are invariably unhelpful. Um, I, I take a much simpler view, which is really to say, intuitively, we sort of understand that religion is about a transcendental world. It's mm -hmm. about a belief in a kind of spirit world of some kind which comes through a sense of direct experience for that. that. That's something that's happening in our minds. We can't reach out and touch it. Um, but that creates this, this sense of belief in, in a, a transcendental world. And, and I'm happy just to go along with that for the time being and see uh, how far we get with it. Um, and uh, we can always change the definition in the light of our better understanding at the end of our journey. Um, but that's a kind of minor issue. This is very much a scientist's approach to, to definitions. Don't worry too much about the definition. Just have a definition that will allow us to discuss the phenomenon. Right. And then now, this leads ahead, us please. to distinguish between these two different kinds of religion generically, which have long been recognized ever since the end of the 19th century when people started to write about this topic, that there's a kind of... Um, the, I, I hesitate to use the word primitive, but I use the word primitive <laughs> to mean old rather than anything else. Sense of um, religions that have an animist character to them. They believe in spirits inhabiting all parts of the world that we live in. So mountains and streams and hills and wells and, and, and so on all have spirits associated with them. And sometimes these spirits are beneficial to us and sometimes they try to set traps for us maybe um, and so on and and part of the problem we have is is to make sure that the these spirits are happy with us and our behavior and will facilitate the a good harvest or whatever it may be a good hunt and so on but and and that really is the pattern of religion you find in in small very small scale traditional societies hunt together societies it clearly is very very ancient indeed and then sometimes you mentioned 
around the time uh, that we started to live in settlements. And mm -hmm. here's the big problem, I think, that living together in cramped spaces, villages and, and towns, is very stressful, and that it led to the development of uh, forms of religion which have much more specific gods uh, rather than just sort of spirits, that there are specific gods uh, who who um, uh, rule the world in 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 some way. Um, the, the, these mostly are, are polytheistic religions, and they really? appear to have sort of arisen around all well, perhaps about seven or eight thousand years ago. Uh, there's another phase after that, which happens about um, two thousand to three thousand years ago, which is sometimes known as the Axial Age, when you have a whole series of new religions arising um all around the world which are um philosophically much more sophisticated they 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 tend to be um in some form monotheistic to to have a single god rather than many gods not always quite true but um uh, they, they 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 have a much more um highly developed moral code which is handed down from if you like from god in person so right. think about the um um uh, uh, tablets being handed to Moses on uh, on the mountain uh, by God. Here are the Ten Commandments. And many of these kind of axial age religions have this kind of sense of um, the, the supreme God handing out um, proper ways to behave. Let's talk about the two features of religion you uh, mentioned in your book, uh, Professor Dunbar. You say religions are universal and they tend to fragment over time. What is the significance of these features? I think the significance of it actually is exactly the same as we experience with languages. Um, uh, so it's very obvious that new religions arise from cults and sects that start in some small corner of a big religion, a uh, big modern day religion. They're constantly spawning new cults. They're usually regarded as heretical. So so the powers that be try to suppress them. Um, but uh, 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 that's not true of all uh, religions. If you think of Hinduism, you know, mm -hmm. that par excellence has been very tolerant of, of cults and sects arising as it were and, and maintaining them within the fold. Um, but most most religions, and especially the Abrahamic religions, have not been so tolerant. Um, these these sort of emerge under the, the the instruction, if you like, of a charismatic individual. Of course, you think of all these big world religions: uh -huh. Buddhism, uh, Islam, uh, Jainism, uh, Sikhism. They all have some founder that everybody recognizes, put it in place. Um, and I think this is. Very similar, it seems to me, to, to the, what happens with languages, and for the same reason, that languages constantly fragment. You know, once upon a time, only a few thousand, well, 1,500 years ago, maybe less, a 1,000 years ago, there was one English language. There yeah. are now officially uh, six, and uh, in English as spoken in the subcontinent is being considered as the seventh uh, separate <laughs> uh, language of English, which is... Uh, you know, reflective of how these things develop over time. And I think the reason goes back to the fact that religions and languages allow you to identify very small communities and therefore built into them is, a, if you like, a mechanism for ensuring that your language or religion in the next door valley is different to mine. So the moment you, you speak to me, I know you are not from my village or my valley that you come from the other another place and the same with your religion you, you don't understand the same religious practices as i do and i think that's partly um the origins of this that it religions in particular evolve to be able to ident not only to make us feel bonded as a community but they also allow us to recognize who is a member of our religion and who is not Let's now talk about your uh, idea of the mystical stance. It's a very interesting idea, uh, I think. And I wonder, what is it about humans that makes them adopt the mystical stance? Uh, that, that's probably the biggest question 
explored, <laughs> and I'm not sure I know what the actual answer is. <laughs> we we can kind of point in in the right directions, I think, uh -huh. if you like, in the sense that it's very clear that one feature of it seems mm -hmm. to have to do with the endorphin system in the brain, which is part of our social bonding mechanism. It's an opiate uh, because its purpose, uh, the reason we have it, it, it is to manage um, pain. It, it's part of the brain's pain control system. Um, but being being an opiate, it creates these kind of um, uh, <sighs> psychological states uh, which l make us feel we're leaving our body and, and, and going into another plane of existence. Clearly, uh, we interpret that usually as, as entering a spirit world. And so once the, the, the endorphin system is lifted enough by certain kinds of practice, and you might do it uh, the sophisticated way through meditation, um, where you know, various practitioners have learned how to induce uh, um, trance states, through breathing exercises and so on, or you might do it the the um, sledgehammer way, which is doing an awful lot of dancing or running marathons right. or uh, starving yourself. Uh, um, they, I, all of these seem to trigger the endorphin system, and, and if you do it at a high enough level, it flips you over into a trance state. But it's interesting that every single culture around the world that has these kind of experiences describes them in very much the same way. You have this flash of light um, the world is lit up and you appear to be going down a tunnel of light and into another world. Um, uh, it, it's very, very striking how consistent the, the descriptions of the, that are in, in different cultures. Um, let's now move to... The other, sorry. sorry? Uh, let's now move to the uh, point you make about shamanic religions and doctrinal religions. And you say that there is a continuity between the two doctrinal religions uh, build on and right. uh, uh, are literally encrusted around shamanic pra practices. And you've explained uh, this very uh, well in your book. Now, what's the significance of the continuity that you posit? I think the, the, the issue is really, um, well, well, let me just back up one step and, and, and make the observation that traditionally we've People who study the history of religions and so on tend to view this kind of animist, uh, very ancient animist phase and the doctrinal phases as mm -hmm. two separate things. One replaces the other. And it seemed to me um, just sort of observing the religious world uh, for, for, uh, over the course of my lifetime, as it were, that this is not the case, that actually all the practices that underpin the animist religions are all still there, even in the great world religions as we have them have them today, the great uh, monotheistic uh, doctrinal religions. They're there and they provide the kind of basis for the direct mm -hmm. religious experience of the transcendental world, without which you would have no reason to believe in religion in any form. So my argument here, if you like, is People don't join religions for intellectual reasons. They aren't persuaded True. by some philosophical argument. What they're persuaded by is some dramatic experience um, in some context. And, and very often that's associated with uh, a, a trance experience where the particular circumstances have, have triggered a trance experience in, in you or, or deep emotional um upset as it were that can have the same effect um so the, the 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 big difference between these two really is in terms of the layering of if you like philosophical more philosophical mm -hmm. um uh explanations for what's going on so if you look at hunter-gatherer religions these animist shamanic trance-based religions there's often no real explanation uh, for what's going on, and, and their moral codes don't come down from God. They're just the things. That's how we do them. You know, this is how we behave. They're, they're not divinely given. The shift of doctrinal religions in, tends to involve specialist priests, special uh, places for religious rituals. In other words, temples or mm -hmm. something of that kind. Uh, a belief in particular gods and a belief in in 
moral codes that have been handed down uh, from some supernatural uh, uh, source, as it were. Um, and, and what I think is actually happening here is the shift into um, living together in very cramped, large group sizes, now mm -hmm. exceeding maybe a few hundred people, um, and, and gradually over, over very quickly over time, actually, uh, reaching tens of thousands of people. We think of the sort of um, historical Jericho, as it were, in, in, in pre-biblical or biblical times, where there might have been 10,000 people. The problem you had was how to maintain people in behaving decently uh, without uh, uh, um, uh, behaving badly towards each other and stealing from each other or, or fighting with each other. And, and these doctrinal religions seem to be quite good at holding the lid on those kinds of very disruptive behavior patterns. Because if you didn't, weren't able to hold the lid down and persuade people to behave decently towards each other, then these towns would, and villages would have just exploded and and, and uh, um, mm -hmm. dispersed, and everybody would have gone and lived on their own on their own farms, if you like, somewhere rather than living together in one place. So, in order to kind of allow us to live together in one place, we have to have rules of behavior and rules of behavior that we accept because they're handed down to us from uh, the divine. Uh, in some way, therefore we can't argue with them, right? You know, whereas if you know, if if we have a secular society, um, you and I might take the view uh, that uh, we should organise it in this way, and we try and make everybody behave that way. But usually, what happens is they just say, "And so, you know, why why should we do what you want us to do? We're going to carry on." So you have to have a moral code which is has force. Of of the divine behind it, um, that uh, as I sometimes describe it, um, you, you need to be able to um, say, you know, we didn't like what you did uh, on Saturday night after the community dance uh, around the back of the the barn, <laughs> um, uh, and you may think that we don't see these things, but there is somebody who does, and that is God, because God is omniscient, <laughs> so, and that makes us go, oh, I'm terribly sorry. I, I won't do that again. <laughs> Let's move on now to another important point you make in the book. You say that believing, and by extension religion, is good for us at both the individual and societal levels. Now, some might balk at this idea because they see religion as a status quo force. What do you say to that? I think the answer is um, that there is no question really that religions evolved in this small scale context to create a bonded society, to keep the group working together. Mm -hmm. um, and they very much do that. I mean, that in, this, in some senses, you already mentioned that's part of their problem because they often do that by creating an us versus them. We believe the true beliefs. Uh, those people in the next door valley, well, you know, look what crazy things they believe. <laughs> and so that, that you know, creates a sense of, yes, we belong together. We are here for a purpose. And, and um, you know, we must go and convert those people over there. That, that's what kind of produces these negative uh, consequences. That said, slightly contrary to many of the recent claims that religions don't... Um, uh, uh, have any personal benefit for you. In fact, there's actually quite a lot of evidence that religious people do um, suffer less sickness on the whole, uh, are happier, uh, even maybe even live longer, recover from surgery, for example, more quickly. Um, there's something about their religious beliefs or practices that creates a kind of uplift. Now, I think what does that is the endorphin system, because the endorphin system, as an opioid, uh, very similar in many ways to 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 morphine in its, in its um, uh, how we experience it. Mm -hmm. First of all, it just makes you feel very relaxed and contented and at peace with the world and and uh, not depressed. So this is the best antidepressant medicine you can ever get. And may I just point out to you, it is free. <laughs> Well, that is true, Professor Dunbar, but 
what you say has to be balanced against our recent and very distressing, I might add, experience with religion across the globe, manifesting as uh, xenophobic religious nationalism and so on. Besides, mm -hmm. I was intrigued personally by the fact that in a book uh, that's about 300 pages, there are just two references to Karl Marx, one on page 49, one on page 64, very brief. And I thought perhaps his idea that religion is created by people and is a function of the social and economic context in which they operate uh, ought to have gotten a, you know, more decent treatment. This is just my view. I don't know what you think. <laughs> Uh, I, I, I promise I'll write volume two then. <laughs> <laughs> yes, you should. Um, <laughs> Absolutely. Um, I, 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 the issue, of course, in, in some sense, Marx was right. I mean, when he spoke about um, religion as being the opium of the people, he didn't quite write it like that, but that's what everybody claims he, he, he wrote. Yes. But it's, it's kind of a good enough summary. Um, I think he was genuinely right, uh, in a sense right for the wrong reason, perhaps, but, but he was genuinely right. Religion does create this sense of belonging and, and mm -hmm. willingness to accept, mm -hmm. if you like, being at the bottom of the pile in the way that he was thinking about it, you know, mm -hmm. that, that it makes the peasants and the workers conform to the benefit and the will of, of um, uh, their masters. And this is true, and it, this goes back to, it, it's built into um, this whole idea that the doctrinal religions arise as the creation of essentially a hierarchy that creates, um, or an elite that creates the kind of philosophical and uh, ritualistic and other um, uh, descriptions of of a particular religion. They, they they're the the you know the religion. Whereas shamanic religions come from the individual and are the collective product of all of us um, engaging in trance dancing and experiencing these trance effects and so on. The doctrinal religions are very clearly, uh, in some sense, imposed from above right. in society by, by the elite in society, who are the ones who, and indeed, interestingly enough, uh, you only get these kind of religious specialists, as they're sometimes called as a general term for priests and, and whatever name you want to give them, right. and therefore of doctrinal religions, you only get those kind of religions when your productivity, essentially your agricultural productivity, gets high enough to allow some people not to have to work for a living mm -hmm. um, uh, and can therefore spend time thinking about uh, these deep philosophical and religious issues in order to create your religion, as it were, um, because other people are going to provide them with the food they need and so on. So there is a sense in which it is very much, if you like, as Mark, Mark said, I, I think it was a bit unfair in a way in on religion in that, um, uh, it, you know, he didn't recognize that actually it can be quite beneficial. And the question you have to ask, if you're in those kind of uh, traditional uh, small-scale societies of the kind we've we've had until really probably only the last hundred or two hundred years at most. You know, <laughs> were you better off going? Okay, I accept what you say. I'll, I'll keep my head down and work hard, producing food, and you will protect me because you're the you're the uh, owners of the land and and, and so on. Uh, and protect me against uh, raiders from 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 somewhere else, um, or should 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 these poor peasants have revolted against their landlords? <laughs> you know, this is there isn't a perfect answer to this question. It depends. You know, you make True. a judgment. Do do you, do you want safety and security, and you pay this price? Uh, and that of, in of turn is to... a function of one's class position, is it not? Ah, not really. No, it's straight economics, really. <laughs> it's you know, it's what what are the alternatives in a in a small scale peasant society that the individual can do? Because our safety and security rests on being able to live together in communities, and if if we break the community up, 
by revolting, let's say, um, we lose those benefits. Uh, and they, you know, we expose ourselves to to risk of attack and risk of uh, predators capturing us because we're, we're we're living not in groups but on our own. Um, so, you know, I don't. Most of life, let's be fair, is a is a trade off. <laughs> you pay your money and you takes your choice as to what you think is the best way to do things. Sometimes you get it right, sometimes you don't. Um, and I think this is. You know, lies at the, the the heart of this. But yes, you know, I, I mean, I probably could have mentioned uh, Marx more often, uh, maybe. But I, I, he, I think he's sitting there, um, yeah, benignly smiling. Um, <laughs> at, at, uh, All right, <laughs> let's <laughs> move on. Now, I wish to uh, draw your attention to community size and the social brain hypothesis, mm -hmm. and you arrive at the f a number 150 and you say that's the optimal size of a congregation. Can you, for the benefit of our viewers, tell us uh, very briefly, A, how you arrived at this number, and B, what is the significance of 150 for our understanding of religion? Okay, so this um, idea that there is a kind of natural size of social group came out of... Um, uh, a study I was doing of the relationship between group size mm -hmm. and brain size in uh, the primates, uh, the monkeys and apes, as you mentioned at the, in your introduction. Um, and it turns out that there is really quite a tight relationship um, between the size of group a species has, the typical size of group a species has, and the size of its brain. And all I did uh, originally was say, okay, well, we know what size human brains are. Let's see what this equation for this relationship would predict for humans. And the number it predicted is about 150. Mm -hmm. um, and I then spent uh, a lot of time <laughs> trying to find out what the natural size of human groups are. And the first place I looked was hunter-gatherer societies, and it turned out to be a standard grouping size. The hunter-gatherer societies are like our societies. They're quite complex because there are several layers. So the family lives in a village. Correct. The village lives in a, a county. The county is in a state. Uh, you might think of it in those kind of terms, that kind of hierarchical structure. But it turns out there is one consistent level of hunt all hunter-gatherer societies, sometimes referred to as a clan, sometimes as a community or regional grouping, which has a size of almost exactly 150 um, this is not the size of group they live in. Uh, they live in much smaller groups, uh, but this is a kind of size of group which is their extended community. It's actually about the limits that we have in those kind of societies for all our kin, our extended kin, insofar as we have kinship names for them. Mm -hmm. Um, uh, uh, you know, that would be covered. So it really goes out to second cousins. Everybody out, outside that is a stranger, if you like, in those kinds of sizes. Then we looked at the size of personal social groups. We've looked at this by asking people to make lists of who their friends and extended family members are that they feel they have a relationship with. We've looked at people's phone calling patterns in their mobile phone in big national mobile phone databases. We've looked on Facebook to see, looked at pay posting patterns, who's posting named messages to who, and what the actual number of friends, the distribution of the number of friends on Facebook. Um, and then in all sorts of other contexts, it also keeps coming up. It comes up in the size of natural uh, structures in the way the military organize. Uh, armies, modern armies all around the world have a very similar structure. It's the typical size of the company. And for those who've been in the army, they will know that company means family right. <laughs> to you, right? They try to replace your real family and friends by the company so you work and fight together. And that's a really tightly bonded bonded unit, much the most important unit in the army. So in all these kind of contexts, we keep finding um, this number 150. And I think the, the and some of these samples are huge. I mean, the, the, the biggest one of the lot was an analysis of 61 million Facebook pages. So mm -hmm. just looking at the number of friends that each person had on their Facebook page and the average over 61 million people. So your your sample might be there. It's a good chance that it was in there if you're on Facebook. And thank you very much for contributing to science. Um, 
the average was exactly 149. Now, you don't get any closer in my <laughs> sphere of work to, to in a prediction to, to of 150. Uh, All right, uh, well, that. that's well taken, but how would you respond if someone said that this number that you come up with perhaps does not apply in the context of Eastern religions, Hinduism, Sikhism, Jainism, I mean, Buddhism, and so on. And secondly, uh, here in America, we have, as you know very well, this phenomenon of mega churches, yeah. uh, which attract thousands of people routinely. I wonder what your response would be. Yeah, uh, the, uh, the, 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 all the research has been done uh, we haven't ourselves done any research on the optimal size of congregations or, or of, of churches, if you like. Um, uh, all that's been done by other people, but there's a very big literature on that, mm -hmm. which sh suggests that, you know, 150, about 150 really is the ideal size. If it's too small, it uh, is too much hard work for mm -hmm. people to try and manage the church affairs for the congregation. If it's bigger than that, people feel they aren't engaged and the church isn't necessarily helping them out in the way they want them to. And they tend to leave in, in, in both cases. Um, we search very hard for data on the sizes of, uh, say, Sikh Gurdwaras. Right. Uh, um, uh, er, 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 um, uh, maybe uh, 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 Jewish uh, synagogues, um, um, uh, Islamic mosques, and so on, but we just could not find any any studies that produced produced data for these. There is a suggestion, though, that that is an, an optimal size. Of course, it doesn't mean to say you can't have big bigger ones. And this has been the experience in the kind of uh, certainly in the Protestant um, Christian tradition that if you're congregation size goes above about 150, you can have a bigger church, but you essentially have to subdivide it into sub-congregations, each with their own priest. Mm -hmm. um, uh, and so, you know, they, they, that you actually see that happening in Catholic um, parishes because they will have several Sunday services. And there's the nine o'clock service, the 10 o'clock service, and the 11 o'clock service. Right. You, you, you might have a congregation of 500, but they split into these three, and each congregation has its own favoured priest, and each congregation doesn't talk to the other con <laughs> uh, uh, <laughs> congregations right. within within the church. So but it's an interesting question of, and I think I don't know. I think if you look at the size of Buddhist monasteries, for example, you'll find these kind of numbers uh, reappearing there. Um, I. I can't speak in a sense at all for for for, for the Hindu context. I, I, I just know a, rather less about that, maybe. Um, but the what's kind of uh, interesting as much as anything about the the modern American situation of the mega churches and the TV tele, televangelist sort uh -huh. of situation. Um, just looking at it and and observing it, what I'm struck with here is something that looks much more like a pop festival. It's a big <laughs> pop concert. Well, yes, indeed, I agree with you. Uh, and, you know, it is not a unified congregation. And I suspect if you look at them, uh, the mega churches where they all actually are in one place, you'll find that they partition down in some way into subgroupings, which, which are uh, of much, much smaller size. Um, because the, the general problem that the any of these kind of religions have historically as they've and even the kind of s sort of subdivisions within within religions that they've had as they've grown um uh through time historically in other words as they got bigger and bigger and bigger and become more successful is how to control and manage um the 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 believers within your tradition um because of this bubbling up component you see this in 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 the many of the 
Catholic monasteries, right. uh, um, monastic traditions. There's, uh, you know, you get you get radical disagreements <laughs> at opposite ends, as it were, where different monasteries start to get different beliefs and, and split off. The Franciscans are a famous example of this. Um, now, I, I think we have, uh, we are running out of time. I have several more questions. So uh, I'd like to go get through as many as possible. Let's okay. move now briefly to uh, the question of social relationships and how religion is imbricated in this process. You talk about three particular aspects, actually four of them. You talk about the endocrine system. Uh, you talk about mentalizing. You talk about rituals and synchrony. Can you briefly explain to us how these different elements that you identified promote social bond. Yep. And a more yep. foundational question uh, is, why is it not possible for a secular <laughs> entity or arrangement to bring about the same effect? Right. Okay, so so the, 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 there's a sort of, I suppose you might see this religious phenomenon as involving two separate um, processes going on in the brain at the same time. One of them is is the effects of the endorphin system. Now, the endorphin system, as I said, is part of the brain's pain management system, but primates in general, and, and, and we ourselves as humans too, have, if you like, captured that to use it as the basis for creating personal bonds, personal friendships and, and family relationships, the warmth that you feel towards somebody and the willingness uh, to to help them, um, that that's been absolutely fundamental. It's very very ancient within within the primates, and it's very important for us. What religion seems to do is to what the rituals of religion seem to do is uh, activate the endorphin system uh, in a very strong way. And very often they're the same kinds of things we use in the social. Uh, for our social relationships, that's Correct. say singing, dancing, um, uh, storytelling, all feasting together, all these things that you mentioned earlier. Um, so the endorphin system um, really is is the the basis, as it were, and that that's triggered by many of these ritual processes, and it turns out synchrony. So when we do things in synchrony such as dancing or singing together mm -hmm. somehow it creates this extraordinary uplift and 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 what it's doing actually is ramping up the endorphin system dramatically and creating this sense of calmness and at peace and all's well with the world and you're a wonderful person and and uh, <laughs> um so on um uh, but so that's the basic glue, if you like, that A, we use to bond our social communities in the first place. But it, religion has, if you like, has exploited in order to create this sense of community of, of belonging. But running across the top of this is this other process, which is much more explicitly cognitive. If you like, the endorphin system is subconscious. We, we, we right. know about it because we feel it, but we often can't explain it you know um uh, i often think this is why teenagers use the term you know what i mean so often in their conversations <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's exactly that problem um but running across the top of it and what really gives rise to the doctrinal systems in particular is this phenomenon of mentalizing which is the ability to understand what somebody else is thinking right so it's to be able to, the ability to be able to see what the consequences of your actions are what the consequences of your your actions towards uh, one person might have for a third person who might be your friend. So you know, if you if you abuse your your cousin, uh, maybe your grandma is not very happy, right? right? Because you are all her grandchildren, <laughs> um, and it's our ability. It, mentalizing allows us to see these wider consequences and therefore control our behavior better. We're not perfect. Uh, but we're be much better at it than, than any other species. That's, that's for absolute sure. So it's these two psychological processes, essentially they are, neurological processes running in tandem with each other that, that creates this sense of um, belonging, but also spills out to create this sense of religion because the endorphin system 
seems to trigger be involved in the triggering of trance and and this creates this um, mental state in which we believe we're you know sort of immersing ourselves usually it's described as immersing yourself in god or immersing yourself in the divine principle different religions have different uh terms for it but it's essentially all the same thing and and i don't think we could have these experiences if our mentalizing capacities weren't as good as they are and and one reflection of that is that people who do not have um you know the, the people vary quite a lot on them in their mentalizing abilities as it were and at right. one end are, are people who are who, who simply don't um, uh, understand how other people's minds work, if you like, and they tend not to have these kind of religious experiences. So if you like, this is some pointer to the fact that um, mentalizing plays a very important role in our our, our ability to understand and, uh, these experiences, uh, mental experiences we have during trance or trance-like states. Uh, we are almost completely out of time. I have two quick questions to ask you, Professor Dunbar. Uh, number one, uh, in the light of all that you have uh, said in your book, what do you think going forward should be our strategy in dealing with so, uh, pathologies of religion? It could be militant religious nationalism. It could be fundamentalism and so on, do you think there is a more fruitful way of engaging with these developments? Yes, if you're optimistic, but it requires us to cooperate a bit better with us. And, you know, it's reflected very much in the kind of ecumenical movement within um, some of the modern uh, religions, as it were, where, you know, the imam from a mosque and right. perhaps the uh, priest from a, uh, a, a temple or something like that and the Christian pastor get together and, and, and try to engage and cre create a positive, friendly relationship. But my worry is that these effects are so powerful and they, they are so built around this sense that I have the true belief you know, um, uh, you know, which is why we get these charismatic individuals emerging that start new religions off. Um, and that creates this antipathy. You know, I've, uh, you, you non-believers, I've got to persuade you that you're right. <laughs> uh, we even do that with politics, for heaven's sakes. <laughs> so, right. uh, you know, why would we do any better, better um, with religion? So uh, I, I fear that there is always the risk. Now, you know, we can guard against that. I think that depends on how um, committed we are to creating a better world where people, uh, you know, tolerate each other and 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 uh, are more friendly towards each other. Right. And that's something which we can learn. I think. Um, uh, so it's getting away from this sense that your religion is the only religion. You know, it, in the famous saying, there are many paths to the top of the mountain. <laughs> right. Now, talking about be... creating a better world, Professor uh, Dunbar, this is my last question to you. As flawed as it is, you say there can be, or there is at least now, no uh, secular humanist alternative. Yeah. How confident are you that one will not emerge in the years to come? I, I, the reason for being skeptical is there have been many attempts to produce in the, True, certainly and you in talk the last about them. 200 years uh, to produce secular religions. And re really, they just haven't worked. Um, and I think the reason is and environmentalism is a kind of current um, enthusiasm of this kind. Um, but somehow there's something always missing. It, it, they can do the rituals, they can do the singing and the dancing and all these kind of things. But there's something about the transcendental world that's missing in them all uh, that isn't, you know, and that can't be there because all these secular religions, including environmentalism, as, as we now uh, experience it uh, on the streets, doesn't have this sense of a mystical transcendental world that 
just changes your experience and makes you behave differently, which is what happens when you go into trance. This is such an extraordinary, um, uh, overwhelming uh, mental experience when you go into trance or have these kind of trance-like experiences during a conversion process that it literally changes your world and nothing in the physical world, I'm sorry to say, perhaps accepting music, um, you know, has that effect on us. And so I'm kind of, you know, well, if if you, if you can find a way of solving that, um, then we'll all sign up to your religion. Uh, let me put it put it that way, because you will have you will have and you probably deserve the Nobel Peace Prize too. Uh, Absolutely, for your contribution. I'll keep trying. <laughs> uh, and on that note, I will have to bring this interview to a close. Thank you so much, Professor Dunbar, for taking the time to talk to us. It was a great treat and a pleasure to uh, engage you in this dialogue. Thank you very much. Well, thank you. It was great fun to, to talk to you about this. That's it for this edition of Ideas and Insights. Thanks for joining us today. In the coming weeks, we will discuss Deeply Responsible Business, a global history of values-driven leadership, written by Professor Jeffrey Jones of the Harvard Business School. In this book, published by Harvard University Press this year, Professor Jones addresses a central question of business ethics. What does it take to run a successful, purpose-driven business? Professor Jones profiles business leaders from across the world who combine profits with social purpose to confront inequality, inner city blight, and ecological degradation while navigating restrictive laws and authoritarian regimes. Watch out for an exciting discussion in the coming weeks. Until then, stay safe and goodbye.